Hello, this is Mighty Scon, and welcome to a playthrough of Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. I'm very excited about this game, and not having played the first game, I'm going into it a little blind, but I do have high expectations based on the reviews of the first game. So I do want to let you know that I did put in some time researching this game by watching the backer updates that Obsidian put out as they were developing this game, just so that I would know what to expect and what they were aiming at with certain design decisions. I also wanted to shout out to the channel Fextra Life, that is F-E-X-T-R-A-L-I-F-E. -E. They put out a bunch of class guides on release day that I thought were very well done and they helped me understand what each one has to offer. Alright, so let's get into the intro part of the game where we learn about the previous events and also create our character. Aora, a world where mortals live, die, and are reborn through the turning of the wheel. The cycle of reincarnation watched over by the gods and made possible through pillars of a mystical substance known as Audra. Five years ago, you traveled from your home to the Deerwood, a nation that had waged war against the incarnated god of light Aethys, resulting in his destruction. The country suffered from a plague of hollowborn, infants born without souls, that many believed was punishment for killing a god. In an ancient, secluded ruin, you witnessed a secret ritual that inadvertently transformed you into a watcher, one who can see and speak with souls. The ritual also gave you horrible visions, waking nightmares of a past life that threatened your sanity. To put them to rest, you pursued the man who had led the ritual, a seemingly immortal agent of the gods, known as Theos Ix Arcanon. With divine assistance, you confronted and defeated Theos ending your visions and resolving the Hollowborn Crisis. In so doing, you also learned the great secret that Theos had protected, that the ancient Empire of Anguith had transformed themselves into gods. Your visions finally put to rest, you retired to the castle of Cadnua, built atop a massive statue of pure Audra, where you ruled in relative peace and prosperity. Made a nice story. You fixing up that old keep? Lifting the curse? <laughs> Must have told it a hundred times. But something got to gnaw at me. Thinking the spirits there weren't really at rest. But maybe the gods weren't finished with us. I used to dream that when my god came back, he would forgive us. the trouble with dreams. Sooner or later, we all have to wake up. So you wake to a sleepless world, the in-between of life and death. 
Follow your memories. You have been here before. So we are once again in purgatory. Let's walk through here. You have seen past the shroud. You are a watcher now, and a watcher you will stay. A watcher sees souls, knows their pasts, and the souls see them back. A dubious honor, inheriting a fortress both broken and cursed. Hmm. It's kind of cool that you can see the past memories of what happened before. What is a god? Hmm? A higher power? A rewarder of good deeds and punisher of the wicked? The gods aren't real, but something else entirely. Something created by people. And did you ever consider that these were things you were never meant to understand? That their comprehension is beyond you? Let the world see. Let them decide what to do. The wheel has turned again, Watcher. Come. An aged dwarf shares this strange floating platform with you. His face is creased by so many wrinkles that his features lie buried amid shadowy pockets of skin. Still, the dwarf's well-practiced habits have left telltale tracks of a welcoming rictus across his visage. You can see his smile coming before it blooms, reshaping the dwarf's face from a hanging sack of flesh into something resembling an oddly carved Mary Gore replete with unhealthy bumps and discolored splotches. Alright, so this is the character creation portion of the game. I do like the story that uh, in this game you can restart your life over and over with the wheel. Sit. Please. So you can continuously choose different paths if you wanted to. It's kind of a neat little thing. I think it's a really well done idea. You get tutorials, click on the chair. Easy enough. Thank you for joining us, Watcher of Cad Nua. The gaunt woman seated at the table is clad in time-worn black armor that seems too massive for her to move in. I think it's pretty neat that you can actually read about different parts of the game. A pale, slender neck rises from the gorget, topped by a hollow face. The milky skin stretched across it is delicate and translucent, like parchment that has been scraped clean too many times. She is preoccupied with the arrangement of cards on the table between you. With each movement, her armor squeaks and groans as though bearing an incredible weight. She places a final card, gives a nod of satisfaction, and raises her eyes to meet yours. It's also nice that this is fully narrated, which is incredible. Less talking for me. Your brush with the divine has drained you of your powers, fractured your memories. Look upon these cards. They represent the courses of your life. You alone know best how they flowed. Arrange them to fit what you remember. Okay. Pillars of Eternity 1 Histories. So we get to choose the path that we took in Pillars of Eternity 1, which is nice. Having not played that game, I was not able to do this. So you can import a Pillars of Eternity 1 save file. You can also learn about uh, different paths that, that took. Um, so we return the lost Hallowborn souls to the Direwoods children. 
as had pledged to Hylia. So our Hylia is the goddess of sky, maternity, creativity, bird songs. Okay, so she's like a good god in the sense that she doesn't kill people, I guess. <laughs> All right. You were kind and merciful to people you encounter, sympathetic to their pain, and charitable to those who need it. So you're a good person. Fair and balanced. Um, you return to the lost, hollow-born souls the, to the wheel. Okay, so that's not bad. As you pledge to Barath. Barath is the god of death, cycles, doorways, mortality, and inevitability, the keeper of the cycle of life and death. So the wheel, from what I understand, is where souls go when they die, and then they are reborn into a different life. Uh, not having remembered your previous life. So this path kind of just says that you have uh, been fair in the fact that you, everybody that was alive, um, is reborn to a different life. Use the souls of the Hollowborn to strengthen the Direwood as you had pledged to Gallowin. Okay. Most other choices were made to strengthen you and your allies while punishing and weakening your enemies. Not too bad. Uh, consign the souls of the Hollowborn to oblivion as you pledge to Rimagrand. Okay. So the god of death left a wake of physical destruction and spiritual annihilation wherever you went seeking to bring the final end to all things. You're the bringer of death, essentially. Keeper of secrets um, consign the souls of the hollowborn to oblivion. Okay, so same thing. He ultimately gave his souls to Wodica. So Wodica was actually helping Theos in the first game, from what I understand. Everything bad. So he pretty much did everything bad. Scattered the souls of the Hollowborn to a random location. Every companion died. I wonder if, if all your companions are dead, so you, you don't have access to your old companions. Sounds like what this would do. Okay, let's do fair and balanced. I like this one better. Does everything appear to be in order? So this is the Pallid Knight. Okay. Good. Welcome to the beyond. I am Bera. One half anyway. She points a finger in the direction of the dwarf who led you here. Though the movement is slight, her gauntlet squeaks like a rusty hinge. So Bareth is God of Death, Cycles, Doorways, Mortality. Okay, so that's the one I picked. I picked the, uh... So she must represent the one I picked, I think. Or that's coincidence. The dwarf's rictus returns as he nods in the woman's direction. Tell me, do you remember when we last met? Uh, no. You prayed for my help in reaching Theos, beyond the Court of Penitence, and pledged yourself to me. Okay. And though you could have broken your pledge when you defeated Theos at Sun and Shadow, you did not. Admirable. Okay. She delicately places a card on the table. A bell in a tower. Her fingertips slowly drag away from the card faintly creaking as they retreat across the table. You had need of the gods once before. Now it seems we have need of you. The being that occupied Odnua's statue beneath your castle was the dead god, Aeothus. Of this, we are certain. What we do not know is what his intentions are. Okay, so Aeothus is back. Though Aeothus stole a large fragment of your soul, you were strong enough to survive the onslaught and enter the in-between. Aeothus, god of rebirth, redemption, dawn, spring, and light, traditionally shown as a man bearing a candle and wearing a silver crown. Okay. 
recently reformed his essence in the statue of Maros Nua beneath Cade Nua in the process of pulling himself from the endless paths he destroyed the castle and left the watcher of Cade Nua at the brink of death that's us you and he are still connected he has chosen a body made of living Atra perfused with the power of thousands of souls including yours it should be little difficulty for an experienced watcher to find him. I wonder how he did that. How did he steal all the souls? Uh, why don't you just do it yourself? Taking a physical form in Aora is fraught with peril. Most mortal minds and bodies are incapable of containing divine power. It can lead to problems, as Aethys learned not long ago. All right. Her armored hand gingerly places a card sideways on the table. It features a man with a burst of light instead of a head. So I guess we have the choice to do it or not do it or forsake the gods. <laughs> um... If we were Kratos, I know what he would say. Let's just say, uh, well, I'd like to find him as much as you would. He destroyed my castle and killed who knows how many people around it. I know. It is my business to know. 322 in Cadnua and your surrounding lands. Their souls remain in Aetha still. You have the power to save them. Serve me and I will return you to your body. Or don't, and return to the wheel. How does that work then, if I go to the wheel? Let's find out. Unfortunate. This will prove much more difficult without someone of your unique talents and circumstances. She raises her gauntleted hand and gestures to the dwarf hovering at the periphery. The dwarf nods, the supernaturally wide smile returning to his face. He gestures for you to follow him. Let's see what happens. No sooner has Barith spoken than you feel yourself dissolve. It is not an unpleasant sensation. Something between falling asleep and drifting on a warm current. Your essence is pulled through the Adra, where it mingles with the stuff of thousands of other souls. Your thoughts, your memories, even your identity as the Watcher fade like a dream. Hmm. Eventually, your soul reforms and finds its way into a small, crawling thing of fur and claws. You know the world by sound and scent, as food and danger. The concerns of gods and nations are beyond you. It is a simple and satisfactory existence, though your mind can conceive of no other. Whether it is a long one will depend upon the watcher Barith chooses in your stead. Huh, that's interesting. Is that it? The game's over? <laughs> that is hilarious. I beat the game. Sort of. So that's the ending, I guess. She's preoccupied. Your brush with the divine has drained. Okay, so I chose fair and balanced with is uh, breath. Let's see if it, um, let's try Benevolent Soul, which is Hylia. Let's see if Hylia appears this time. Does everything appear to be in order? Yes. Good. Welcome to the beyond. Nope, it's still breath. I am Bera. One half anyway, and return to the wheel. So we took the wheel option last time, and it pretty much says you turn into a furry animal and you, that's the end of the game. <laughs> so we have no choice but to take the uh, first one. Let's get on with it. Good. Before you return to Aora as my herald, you must remember who you were, the last whisper of life in death. For a moment, the sockets of her eyes darken, leaving the pits of a death's head gazing out at you. When you can picture your own face, the beyond will lead you back to your own kind, to the world of mortals. 
All right, now we're gonna go into our character creation screen. So let's start off with uh, choosing a sex, male or female. I'll just be male for this playthrough. No real reason why. Okay, so we now have the races. So we have the different races. I do wanna go through briefly what each race does and what it provides. Kind of the pros and cons for each one. And they do have sub races, which we can get into. So Amamua, uh, two might. Sub races are island and coastal. Island, you get to uh, walk through obstacles like uh, water, deep sand, and mud without being impeded in combat. If you weren't a island Amamu, then you would uh, be slowed down in combat when walking through such obstacles. So coastal. Uh, they get Tower Ring Physique Bonus. The Tower Ring Physique Bonus is uh, gives them an additional resistance to Might Afflictions. And Might Afflictions are Staggered Days Stun. So the next race we have is Dwarf. So Dwarfs, they get a plus two Might and plus one Constitution, negative one Dexterity. There are two different sub-races. There are Boreal which get Hunter's Instinct and Boreal, uh, what that does is it gives us a uh, chance to graze instead of miss versus primordial creatures so and wilder creatures. Um, so a graze is just a, uh, it does damage, a lower amount of damage versus a miss which does no damage. Then we have the Mountain Dwarves they get uh, Hale and Hardy, which uh, gives them a resistance to constitution afflictions. So sickened, weakened, and enfeebled. All right, so let's go to elves. They get dexterity, plus one, and plus one perception. The pale elves, they get elemental endurance, which gives them a resistance to burn and freeze damage. Wood elves, they get wily step. So they get a... Uh, resistance towards dexterity afflictions like hobbled, immobilized, and paralyzed. The next one is godlike. So they get a bonus to dexterity and intellect. And they have four different kind of godlikes. They have death godlike. So uh, they have death's usher. Uh, seem, so they have a, when they approach near death, uh, which is I think 25%. So their health is 25% or less. They get increased damage. And they also get Pallid Fate. So when their health is 25% or less, they get an increase in power level, which boosts up all their abilities. So near death uh, triggers both Death's Usher and Pallid Fate. We have the go uh, Fire Godlike. So they get uh, the bonus Battle Forged when they are bloodied or near death. So 50% or less health. They get a bonus to armor rating, and they also deal damage, uh, burn damage, to people around them that hit them with melee. They also get ash and skin, which uh, gives them a burn resistance. Moon godlike, they uh, get silver tide, and so the first time a moon godlike is hurt, bloodied, or near death. So this is 75 to 50, this is uh, 50 to 25, this is 25 or less. Once they are either one of those states, then they automatically generate a wave of healing around them. So they get a healing bonus. The nature godlike, they get wellspring of life. So while they are under effects of any might, constitution, or dexterity inspiration. Uh, so when they get any buffs to their might, constitution, or dexterity, they get an increase in power level. So their power level is increased uh, during that time. So buffing them is uh, gives them extra additional bonuses. The next one we have is human. So we have uh, Plus one to might, plus one to resolve. Uh, meadow folk, ocean folk, and savannah folk all get the same bonus. They get fighting spirit, and 
that just gives them whenever a uh, is blow bloodied or near death they gain an additional accuracy and damage bonus so when they're low on health they increase their accuracy and damage the uh, Orleans they get a negative one to might uh, then they get plus two to perception and plus one to resolve it's a little bit weaker in the damage dealing uh, they also uh, so their hearth all Orleans get minor threat which is if a enemy is being threatened by a teammate they increase their crits essentially so it converts their hits into crits at a greater rate uh, so wild Orleans they get defiant resolve they uh, gain a resistance towards resolve afflictions so it, which is uh, shaken frightened and terrified so those are the bonuses that we get to pick um, as far as the races go and sub races so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a godlike and I'm going to probably choose a moon godlike which gives us a silver tide ability so when we, we gain health as we uh, take damage which is going to help us with our class that we're going to pick so if you pick a moon godlike you have to pick a, a body type and this doesn't really matter, it just gives you different sizes. Um, I'm just going to pick a, uh, let's pick an Amuma. So I'll be a big guy. Alright, we're going to do a multi-class. Uh, you know, let's do multi-class. I know there's some downsides. So downsides to multi-classing is you are limited to the power level that you get for both classes. So you can't get the maximum amount of skills from uh, if you were to say just pick one class there are uh, nine different power levels for example if we look at this uh, ability tree we have one through nine here so we don't get the benefits of eight and nine so we are limited to just seven and below for each class that's the maximum we can get so now we're going to go through each uh, class and subclass. And I'm going to briefly go through this as well. I'm going to tell you the roles and what they're kind of skilled towards. And I'm also going to tell you about uh, the bonuses and the penalties for each subclass. So we have the first one, which is Barbarian. They are crowd control, is their major role. So they deal area of effect damage to groups um, and they also buff groups. Then their minor role is Defender. So they reduce the amount of damage they take kind of your tank the, the resource is rage each uh, class has a different resource type let's go to the subclasses so you can choose from no subclass or berserker so berserker you get a bonus to frenzy which grants uh, tenacious uh, it's a might inspiration and hardy which is a constitution inspiration so when you pop Frenzy ability, you get Tenacious and Hardy inspirations instead of Strong, which is another Might, and Fit, which is another Constitution. So the benefit to this is you get uh, an additional bonus to Penetration and an additional bonus to Armor Rating. You also gain a uh, higher Hit to Crit Conversion uh, on melee and Carnage Attacks while Frenzied. So once again, you pop Frenzy you gain higher crits. Uh, so the penalty is you get confused, which is an affliction towards intellect. So it reduces your intellect by five. So, um, this would affect your area of, of effect uh, bonuses and your area of effect uh, damage spells as far as the area that it, that it uh, affects. Uh, they cannot see their health while frenzied. It's not a too big of a deal, I guess. And we take a continuous broad damage while being frenzied, which I think it's it's fairly low. Um, but it does add up if you are in prolonged states of, of frenzy. The next one is going to be Corpse Eater. 
It gains a bonus called Flesh Communion, which is an ability that if you target a hostile uh, kith, wilder, or beast, and a kith is just a uh, another name for a humanoid type creature. So uh, you got humans, Amamua, dwarves, elves, orlins, and godlike. So when you uh, target them with this ability, you gain health and also additional rage. The penalty is all your abilities that cost rage are increased by one. So instead of Frenzy, which costs three rage, it now costs four rage. Uh, Mage Slayer. So Mage Slayer uh, gets the bonus of successful weapon attacks versus uh, casters. So like wizards, druids, ciphers, chanters. Uh, they have a chance to fail a cast when hit by a Mage Slayer. So it gives them spell disruption. They also gain a passive spell resistance. The penalty though is they can't use potions or scrolls. So you can't multi-class with any of the caster uh, classes. Um, you also lose the spell resistance you get from the passive will also affect your friendly spells. So it reduces the effectiveness on you as a as your class. If you pick Mage Slayer. The next one is going to be Chanter. So they have they are support and they are crowd control. So their main role is support. Secondary role is crowd control. So this is kind of a caster that uh, does a lot of crowd affecting abilities. Their resources phrases. They uh, you can choose between no subclass or the Beckoner. Beckoner uh, invocations summon twice the number of creatures. Uh, they also have summon invocations cost negative one phrases. So your spells for summoning are reduced in cost. And then creatures summoned by invocations are immune to the Paladin Abjuration ability. Alright. And the penalty is Chanter's summons are smaller and have reduced health and duration. So this is kind of a way to get a larger number of summons on the field for cheap. And also the downside is that you have weaker summons. So we have Scald, uh, which gives us a bonus of invocations cost negative one phrase. Okay. Uh, weapon critical hits have a 50% chance to grant a phrase. Okay, so we do deal damage. We have a chance to increase uh, phrase. So this might be a good melee multi-class. Maybe like a rogue. So the penalty is non-offensive invocations cost plus one phrases to cast. Okay, so anything that's not offensive will cost additional to cast. Uh, Troubadour. So we have the bonus of Linger for phrases is increased significantly. All right. I'm not quite sure what Linger is. Uh, maybe we read this. No, it doesn't really tell us what Linger is. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that provides. Um, maybe if we look at phrases. So, Trebador, they get a bonus to uh, Linger. They gain Brisk Recitation, Model, which Model is a ability that you can activate and deactivate. Uh, kind of like a aura or a buff um, that you can turn on or off. So it increases the rate that phrases elapse, but removes the Linger. Okay, so if you activate this, your phrases no longer linger, um, but they elapse at a quicker rate. The penalty is all invocations cost plus one phrases to cast. So all your uh, abilities are going to cost a, an increase to cast. But then they seem to last longer unless you pop this ability here. So kind of a uh, interesting control type of a class here. 
for the chanter. So we have the Cypher class, which is based on crowd control, and a Striker, so this is your offensive uh, attacking class. The resource is Focus, and Focus you gain through uh, combat with weapons. Um, there's also the subclasses, which you can choose none, or Ascendant. So Ascendant, they get a bonus uh, increase to max focus. And when they reach max focus, they gain the Ascended uh, effect for a temporary amount of time and increases your power level, which would in turn increase your damage and reduces the uh, power focus cost to zero. So you're casting uh, free abilities, essentially. A Soul Whip does not turn off while Ascended and provides more bonus damage during Ascended. So Soul Whip is uh, causes your Cypher's weapons to generate a field of parasitic energy that lashes out to the target, increasing damage afflicted and generating focus for the Cypher. So this is your generation uh, spell. And this is the Ascended spell that you get for free. So your generation um, is continuous, so you're continuously generating focus. The penalty though is while you're not ascended, so while you're not at your maximum focus level, you get a penalty to your power level. So you're gonna start off very slow and then work your way up into a higher damage build. So this kind of is the class that, the subclass that you would want to pick for prolonged fights. So while not ascended, Soul Whip does much less damage but will generate more focus, so it helps you get to your maximum focus level. When Ascended fades, focus is reduced to zero. All right. Uh, Beguiler. So all Deception Cypher spells have increased range. Nice. Deception Cypher spells restore focus when successfully cast on enemies that are vulnerable to sneak attack. So there's a special case there. Uh, the penalty is Soul Whip provides less bonus damage and reduced focus against targets that are not vulnerable to state attack. Okay, so this is kind of your prowling mage caster. Soul Blade gains Soul Annihilation ability, a soul enhanced melee strike that consumes the Cypher's remaining power pool and converts it into raw damage on the target. So that's like a, uh, you build up your focus and then you dump it all into a single attack. So maybe just a really big burst of damage. Uh, Shred Cypher spells cost less focus. Okay, so you get a bonus there. Uh, downing an enemy with a melee weapon temporarily grants concentration and raises your max focus. So concentration will let you cast spells without being interrupted. And you also get a bonus to maximum focus, which also would boost up your Soul Annihilation ability. So it gives you more damage through that ability. The penalty is your max focus is reduced, okay? So this is kind of geared to limit the amount of damage you can burst in the beginning, but then if you down enemies, the next enemy you can dump even more damage into them. So a good finisher spell. Druids. So we have uh, crowd control is their primary role, and then you have uh, the minor roles of support and striker. So we have the resource nature spells. And if we look at our subclasses, we have animist. Uh, they automatically learn the following druid spells at new power levels. Okay, so they get a free spell every power level they gain. So if we were to be a uh, non multi class, we would essentially gain a free power level every time we, we level up. I believe that's how that works. Or maybe every couple of levels. Up to power level 9, which is the maximum. If we multi class, we only get to 7. That's the maximum we can get is 7. 
And I think all of these have... Uh, okay, so Fury. Uh, they get uh, free spells as well. Which are geared towards damaging. Um, they also get the bonus uh, of an animal form. Fury's spirit shift into a storm blight. So they turn into a damaging elemental type. Elemental Druid spells gain increased range and penetration. That's nice. So this is your damaging subclass of a Druid. The penalty is they cannot cast Rejuvenation spells, which are your healing spells. So not, not much of a healer. Life Giver. So they get a bonus Rejuvenation spells cast with increased power level. Okay, I see now. So the... Your rejuvenation spells or healing spells are actually increased in power level automatically as a passive. All right. Uh, while spirit shifted, the druid's power level bonus to rejuvenation spells is greatly increased. Okay, so if we sh uh, spirit shift, we get a bonus to the uh, healing that we can do. Uh, we automatically learn the following druid spells. Okay, which are pretty much healing type of spells. The penalty is we cannot cast creature summon spells. So we can't summon creatures. And after we spirit shift, we receive a penalty to our power level. Once we are uh, done with our spirit shift. Until the end of combat. Okay, so we want to only use this spirit shift either towards the end of a fight or to um, out heal any incoming damage. So we have the next one is a shifter. Uh, Druid can switch to any of the spirit shifting animals once each per combat. All right. So we can switch between different animals. Spirit shift is a longer duration. After a spirit shift ends, the Druid is healed a portion of their health. Okay. Uh, so we automatically learn the following Druid spells at new power levels. Uh, so these are the pot, the spells. These look sort of like crowd control spells. Nature's Mark, Insect Swarm, Infestation of Maggots. Yeah, so maybe crowd control type spells. Uh, penalty is we cannot cast spells while in animal form. Okay. So that's not too bad of a penalty. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to go to uh, the next one, which is Fighter. So we have a major role of defender, so defensive, then offensive, and then we have the resource of discipline. So we have uh, no subclass, we also have black jacket, starts with a additional weapon set and weapon proficiency. Okay, so we can do, I think we start with two, so now we start with three. Uh, we reduced recovery time penalty when switching weapons. All right, so this is kind of your multi-weapon uh, specialization. And the penalty is we lose constant recovery. So constant recovery is an ability that you get for free in, uh, if you are a fighter, and it gives you a consistent uh, regeneration of health. So you do lose that uh, re regeneration, which is not good. Um, it could be good. Alright, so, Devoted. May select a single weapon proficiency as their chosen weapon. They increase penetration with their chosen weapon. Increased critical hit damage with their chosen weapon. So you specialize in one weapon. That's the weapon you stick with to gain the penetration and critical hit bonuses. And the penalty is... You gain an accuracy uh, penalization when you choose something other than your specified weapon. And you can only gain a single proficiency and no new proficiencies during level up. So it disables the ability to, um, I think this one right here, to gain an additional weapon set. Maybe you can get an additional weapon set, but you are not able to um, gain another proficiency though. Alright, so let's go to Unbroken. 
we get plus one to engagement, uh, which is the ability to um, keep people locked in combat with you. And then we uh, get increased penetration on disengagement attacks. So if somebody were to leave, try to leave uh, melee range from you, you get an increase in penetration when attacking them still. You get a free attack if they disengage you, or try to disengage you. You get a chance for a free attack. You also gain Shield Mastery, which gives us a bonus to armor rating, which is nice. So this is definitely your tank build. And then we get uh, a penalty to Stride in combat, so it lowers our movement in combat and our reflexes in combat, which I think would make up for our increased armor rating and the ability that we have a shield. So we're an unmovable tank. Monk. We gain the uh, major role of Striker, which is an attacker, um, damage dealer, and we also gain the minor role of Defender. So we have the two different resources. We have Wounds, which... Uh, so we have some of the Monk's abilities require Wounds, and we have Mortification. Some of the abilities require Mortification. Outside of combat, a monk's mortification is restored. Okay. So we alternate between different resources. Uh, the subclass is uh, Hellwalker. So we begin combat with more wounds. All right. And Hellwalker monks gain might for each wounds they have. So we are increasing our damage uh, from the start. Hellwalker monks take more damage for each wound they have. Okay. So we want to dump our uh, damage into, we want to use our wounds up uh, at certain times so we can reduce the amount of damage we take. Nel Pazka. Gain a bonus. Uh, all drug effects last longer. Generate wounds while receiving the bonus of drugs. So we can automatic uh, generation of wounds. And the penalty is crash penalties from drugs cause a monk to be unable to receive healing. So this is a subclass solely dependent on the use of drugs. Degenerate wounds while not benefiting from drugs. All right. Shattered pillar. Gain wounds by melee weapon damage inflicted. Uh, cannot gain wounds from damage received. Required threshold to gain wounds is increased. Maximum wound limit is decreased. I'm not sure what the required threshold to gain wounds is. I don't think it tells me either. Uh, okay, so they have received enough damage to generate a wound. Um, but we can't generate wounds by receiving damage with this subclass. Okay, so certain subclasses may alter this rule. Okay. So, so I'm not so I guess they only gain wounds by dealing damage. Alright, Paladin. So we have uh, the role of support and the role of defense. So a support tank. Resources zeal. Okay, so they uh, Outside of combat, Paladin Zeal is restored. All right. They have five different ones. Uh, Bleak Walkers, uh, which they don't have any penalties. They just gain a bonus. And it, pretty much each one of these alters a specific uh, ability that they get. So Bleak Walkers alter, alters the uh, Devotion ability. So you start with Devotion, uh, Flames of Devotion, and you get an additional ability which uh, applies a sickened affliction. So Flames of Devotion deals additional corrode damage, Black Flames, and applies a sickened affliction. So it alters that Flames of Devotion ability. Uh, Darkozy Paladini. They uh, gain Lay on Hands for free, and they also alters Lay on Hands so that it grants a minor flame shield to the target. And you can actually go in here and you can see the uh, bonuses. So it grants a target a minor flame shield. There you go. Uh, Gold Pack Knights. They gain Sworn Enemy. 
and they gain the uh, upgrade Gilded Enmity, which causes the Paladin to be imbued with a blessing of gold when they declare a sworn enemy. The Paladin receives bonus armor rating until struck. Enough times for the gold to break. Okay, so they gain a temporary additional, kind of like a shield, using Sworn Enemy. And a Sworn Enemy also gives them, uh, I believe it's, yeah, increased damage towards the target. This is good single target uh, damage and protection. Kind Wayfarers, gain Flames of Devotion. Uh, Flames of Devotion heals nearby enemy allies. All right. So you get the same thing as the other one, the Bleak Walkers. Only this one is kind of a bonus to healing instead of uh, negative aura. Or I guess a debuff aura. Uh, Shield Bearers of St. Alga. They gain Lay on Hands. Lay on Hands prevents the target from being killed for a short time. Uh, while equipped with a shield, gain plus one engagement. So this would be a pretty good multi-class for the uh, Unbroken because you also gain a shield mastery automatically and you also gain increased armor rating and plus one engagement. So that'd be a really good combination, I would think. And um, so Lay on Hands prevents them from being killed for a short period of time, which is nice. And I think we can uh, see how long that time is. Can't die for five seconds. Okay. Not bad. All right, now we've come to the priests. Uh, they have the roll of support, which provides uh, defensive bonuses, healing, and protective wards. So a buffer, essentially, or a healer. They have a resource of fate spells. So they have a limited number of spells that they can use in combat. But once outside of combat, they are refunded to them. All right, so they have the different subclasses, which corresponds to the different gods that they uh, are priest of. So they have uh, Barath, and the bonus of Barath is they get free spells um, every time they increase in power level. So these spells for Barath would be more of the debuff types. So Caster's Hands, uh, decay causing immediate corrosive damage and more damage over time in any area effect okay so they're more um, debuff type spells uh, all the meditations a buff actually so that they could just get specific spells that they would be able to uh, either buff themselves or debuff others that's Barath. Uh, Aeothis. This is more of kind of healing slash buff. So you have the different ones. Sunbeam, uh, Withdraw, Protection. So you're buffing your allies, uh, healing them. Uh, Magran. This is more damaging type spells. Uh, based around fire, so you have, because uh, Magran's the war and fire, goddess of war and fire. So fan flames, kind of damaging, damaging. Damaging type spells, maybe a buff here or there. Uh, Skayen, so Skayen is the god of defiance, violent rebellion, hatred. So these are more, I would say, mind type spells. Uh, yeah, punishment, so a debuff to will, uh, break engagement, so you get escape, distribution, okay, so yeah, some more of debuffs that focus towards uh, the mind of a person. Whale, so uh, god of secrets, revelations, illusions, okay, so this is more of your illusionist type priest where you're doing confusion and things like that. All right, so the next class is a ranger. 
they have a attack roll and a defense roll uh, for secondary. The resource is bond, and so bond is. So bond is just a resource they use. Um, it's a fixed amount that outside of combat it's restored. So they can only cast a fixed amount of spells while in combat. Uh, so they have uh, no subclass, ghost heart, uh, immune to bonded grief. So bonded grief is a negative effect. Um, if your animal companion dies, you gain penalties. Um, because your your pet died, and you now have, I think it says, uh, accuracy and other stats go down until revived. So animal companion is immune to engagement. Okay, so that's nice. So so you now have you're immune to the negative effects of having a pet. Your uh, companion can now uh, disengage if it wanted to. And then the penalties are, you must actively summon an animal companion during battle. Okay, so you can't have it with you all the time. It does cost your resources to do do so. Uh, so it's kind of like a temporary summon, if you will. Companion is considered a spirit and is affected by spirit targeting powers. All right. So I'm guessing that uh, spirits have a certain set of. Uh, additional powers besides like a, a beast or so animal companion cannot be healed so you don't have the abilities heal pet or revive pet um, so this is more of summoning a pet temporarily while in combat sharpshooter bonus hit to crit conversions when attacking targets greater than four meters away All right so when you Hit, you have a higher chance to gain a crit uh, if you're four meters away so longer range attacks hence the sharpshooter bonus penetration when attacking targets four meters or closer okay so if you get within range of four meters you gain penetration instead of crits um, penalty they have slower recovery time so this is your slow attack rate and then lower deflection, so lower defenses essentially, uh, to melee. All right, so Stalker. So Stalker uh, gains a bonus deflection and armor rating when within four meters of your pet or your companion. All right, so you have to be close to your pet to get the bonus. And I'm guessing the penalty would be if you're away from your pet, so more than seven meters away, you get bonded grief. So you get lower accuracy and stats if you're seven meters away. You'd only get this um, if you didn't have no class, sub, uh, no subclass. You'd only get this if your pet died or was unconscious uh, during during the fight. All right. So with that, we have. The next class, which is Rogue. So the Rogue is a solely an attacker. And their resource is Guile. And Guile... Uh, outside of combat, a Rogue's Guile is restored. Okay, ready to be used for the next encounter. Alright, so you have a fixed amount you can use per encounter. So no subclass. Uh, you have Assassin class. Gain Assassinate passive, which grants stealth, attack, bonus, penetration, accuracy, and critical damage. So you get the Assassinate um, Assassin's bonus, which uh, boosts up your stealth attacks, so like your backstab, stuff like that. So this is definitely your typical rogue build. All damage received is increased. Okay, so you're a dealing a lot of damage and taking a lot of damage. Street Fighter. Sneak attack becomes more deadly and recovery decreases when the Street Fighter is flanked or bloodied. <clears throat> so bloodied is 
health is between 50 and 25 percent and then flanked is you are surrounded by one by two enemies or more from different directions uh, weapon crit damage increases when street fighter is both flanked and bloodied okay so you get even more crits if you are uh, flanked and bloodied penalty recovery is slower when the street fighter is neither flanked nor bloodied all right so slower attacks when you're uh, not flanked or bloodied trickster learns Archimedes dazzling lights which is on here maybe not okay I know it's an illusionist spell so you learn a an illusion uh, mage's spell or wizard spell and you gain access to illusion wizard spells at power levels 3, 5, 7, and 9 so you'd actually uh, 3, 5, and 7 if you multi-class because you can't get to 9 so you'd still get the benefits of three out of four of these uh, spells, uh, power levels, which is not bad if you multi-class. Spells cost guile to use, so if you dual roll into a mage, it's also an illusionist. You can, I'm assuming, use your rogue-specific versions of those spells that use guile, and then use your mage specific versions of those spells or wizard specific versions of those spells that use their resources all right so sneak attack deals significantly less damage all right so that's the penalty the negative is uh your primary attack which would be sneak attack is less effective and as a trade-off to your gaining these additional damaging spells and the last one is a wizard. They uh, have their crowd control primary role, and then striker, damage dealers, as the secondary role. Their resource is arcane spells, which arcane spells, yeah, limited number of spells used in combat for each spell level. And then, of course, they restore after you're outside of combat. The uh, no subclass, uh, so you, you have access to all. Uh, spells essentially each one of these you're trading a focused version of a college of magic for other college of magics and I'll show you the example here so conjure you gain uh, increased power level with conjuration spells so your conjuration spells are more effective you also gain the bonus of a conjure familiar which is you can summon a, a familiar which is not really a combat pet, but it provides bonuses to their master. So it's kind of a passive bonus that you can conjure. And it could also uh, attack as, as well, if you needed to. So we, the penalty is you lose access to spells from evocation and illusion. So you're trading conjure for evocation and illusion. So you still have access to transmuter and enchanter, but not the other ones. And of course, if it's not Conjuration School, you have a increased recovery time, so your spells are slower to, to fire off if it's not your focus. This is the same for Enchanter. You uh, increase power level with enchanting spells. You gain a, a free action passive once per encounter when the wizard is affected by a dexterity affliction they will clear that effect and become temporarily immune to dexterity afflictions. All right. So this is not uh, a too bad of a one to uh, use with a dexterity class. So like a uh, ranger, maybe a rogue. So the penalty is you can't use illusion or transmutation. That's the downside. Uh, you also get increased recovery time for other schools. So Evoker, Evocation spells are more effective. You get the ability to uh, double cast, which applies their damage and affects the target twice, instantly. That's a small chance. 
I don't know, I don't know what the chance is, percentages. But it says small, so I'm assuming less than 10%. Uh, so penalty is you lose access to transmutation and conjuration. Alright. Illusionist, uh, you gain reflexive mirror once per encounter. When attacked, you gain the effects of the spell mirrored image. And then you lose spells from conjuration and enchanting. Transmuter. You gain Form of the Fearsome Brute, so it's a spell that transforms you into an ogre, and also boosts up your physical attributes. The penalty is you can't do enchanting or evocation spells. So that's uh, the trade-offs from the subclasses, and if you are no class, you can use all the spells, but you get no special ability, and of course you're losing power level for focusing on one particular school. Alright, that is the class section. Okay, so now it's time for me to choose my class. I am going to choose the uh, Barbarian. And I am going to specifically pick Berserker. So I get my bonuses to um, Frenzy. And so I'm trying to offset this... Uh, raw damage continuously while frenzied so the passive that I get with being a moon godlike is the healing effect so that's one way to offset that I also get a bonus to um, intellect so instead of it being negative five I get plus one intellect so I get uh, negative four if you will so my my race is gonna offset some of these penalties I uh, can't see my health, which is fine. I don't, I don't care about that. I'm going to pick Frenzy as my first ability. Alright, so for the next class, I will actually choose the Fighter. Um, the reason I'm choos choosing Fighter, it, which is a fighter slash barbarian, is called a Brute. That's the, uh, I guess, the term for it. It's a Brute. So I'm choosing Brute because I do want to have access to some of the additional bonuses as a fighter which will help me deal more damage. So I'm looking for more damage. Um, I get constant recovery which is going to be very nice uh, in battle. And it's not something I have to turn on, it's a passive effect that is continuously healing me during battle. And then, I'll, and then I can also, uh, I'm not going to specialize in anything as far as uh, classes go. Unbroken would be the only one that I would, I would uh, think would be nice, but I don't like having uh, lower reflexes and lower stride in combat. And I'm not going to use uh, shield mastery very much. So I'm not going to be tanky, in a sense. This is definitely tempting. Um, if I could find a... But I'm not sure which weapons are really good in this game. Um, if I did know, like if I knew I was going to stick with a specific weapon type, I would still pick this one because I can uh, get bonus to penetration and critical hits with my weapon. Let's say I choose uh, two-handed swords. This would be such a nice uh, bonus to have. So since this is my first playthrough in this game, I'm gonna pick no subclass. Um, maybe in the future I'll pick devoted if I know a specific type of weapon I'm gonna use. All right, and then I have uh, discipline, discipline Barrage gives me uh, an inspiration okay I think it's concentration and aware by perception raises converted to hits yeah it sounds like a really good one sounds like a good constant damage and then I have knockdown which is an actual attack uh, so I gain um, I can actually uh, knock them making them prone So this would be good versus casters, I would think. Or even somebody that's trying to do like a lot of heavy damage at one time. I can disable them for a short period of time. I'm going to do knockdown. I have a feeling early on I'm going to be uh, encountering people that are going to need to be knocked down because they're high damage dealers. Alright. So being a brute, uh, you get the recommended, recommended 
uh, stats. So constitution is good for both. Constitution is, is a defensive stat. Um, I definitely want to get might. I want to get uh, the damage in. So I want definitely want to get my, uh, let's see, let's put it up to at least 15 for now. So it tells you the stats, uh, damage, 15% damage, and healing, plus 10 fortitude. Definitely nice. So anything that would affect my, uh, anything that would affect the physical systems of the character. Constitution increases my fortitude as well, so I'm, I'm actually reducing the amount of damage that I would get from uh, from poison and other things like that. I also get more health, 25% more health. So that's a good one. Resolve. So I get to have uh, hostile effect duration. Negative 3%. Hmm. So this would be, I guess, good if I'm fighting a caster. I don't know if I want to pump anything into that. Uh, dexterity. I think this boosts up my action speed. Okay, so... Maybe I want to stick some into dexterity. And then, uh, maybe intellect. To boost up my area of effect and offset my negative traits for being a berserker. Alright, so let's... I think it's a good one. Um, kind of well-rounded, not really uh, focused on anything particular. I could remove some from from this, but then I'm going to take a hit to accuracy. This is good. Alright, so let's go to culture, so we can pick where we are from. Uh, so we can go either lore based or we can go stat based. So I dare, I get plus one resolve, dead fire archipelago, plus one dexterity. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Zimatel planes, plus one resolve. Old Velia, plus one intellect. Uh, Rautai, plus one constitution. Living lands, plus one might. The white and the winds, plus one perception. So either might or might. I think might would be good, um, just to give me additional bonus to that, my damage. All right, then we get to pick. Uh, what was our job? So we have bonus skills like survival, athletics, alchemy. Yeah, let's just go with uh, colonist. It's kind of well-rounded. All right, so this is our weapons. Um, we can pick two, I'm gonna pick axes. Uh, I've looked through these, and what you're gonna look for is damage versus attack time to obviously get your DPS, and then you have recovery time as well. So axes give you uh, four second, 0.7 seconds, but it gives you a pretty good amount of damage. Yeah, this is three seconds, 0.5 attack time. Majority of them are 4 seconds. 11 to 15. 13 and 19. So 19 is the maximum damage you can do with this. Alright, so... I'm definitely going to do two-handed swords. I wish there was two-handed axes. But there isn't. So let's go with uh, two-handed swords. Let's pick us a face. Or a portrait, I guess. There are specific ones for Godhead or Godlike. This is like the only moon one, I think. Yeah, I guess this is this one and this one. Colors. Alright, voice. So if you uh, you have access, um, I bought my game on GOG, and it, 
it gave me a free um, DLC, which gives me additional voices. So we can go through the voices real quick. I'll go on ahead. Let's go. Uh, finish them. Attack. Bring them down. Yeah. These are additional voices, the Vox Machina. This is my favorite part. Well, if you insist, your kneecaps are so dead. Don't be seen. Well, that's a tall order. This one's for Keyleth. Okay. I kind of like this guy. Pose. Uh, let's just go with... Stoic. Sure. Alright. Let's see. We are... I'm just gonna go with something popular like Kratos, the god of war. All right, because we are a god, just like Kratos, or godlike at least. This is our stat summary sheet. Um, it gives us a lot of the information that we need to know. This is what we start with. We start with all these uh, different abilities. And these are our active and passive skills, which we can uh, go through when we level up. So that's going to wrap up this episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I went through everything pretty fast. But in the next episode, we will actually get into combat. Uh, there's a tutorial section that we'll go through first. And then we will go into the actual game and a storyline. So thank you for watching. Appreciate it. Um, give me a, a like if you enjoyed this episode, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks again, and bye.